Good afternoon. My name is Gladys Palma, the Shriner Makers, and I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at CUNY's newest college, the School of Labor and Urban Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's public pro programming, Black Workers and the Triple Pandemic, Confronting COVID, Economic Freefall, and Structural Racism. Today's panels, today's panel discussion is not only timely, but also speaks to the foundation of who we are at SLU and what we do on a daily basis. In fact, some of today's panelists have taught at SLU and have considerable expertise in the areas under discussion. Our mission of social justice and equity for all is not only reflected in our public programming, but also in our courses, certificates, and degree programs. So if you really want an in-depth understanding, I invite you to register for courses like Community Organizing, which examines why and how people in urban communities and neighborhoods have organized to protect their rights. Social movements that examines the interactions among civil rights, labor, and global justice movements. Social justice in the city. Cities are as much sites of creativity and opportunity as they are sites of profound struggle. History of public workers in the US studies how labor and civil rights movement found solidarity. Kevin Rudd, former Australian minister, once opined, education is both a tool of social justice as well as a funda fundamental driver of economic development. At SLU, we provide our students with the tools and the capacity to make the changes we so desperately need in our city, state, and country. During these tumultuous and violent times, the words of Frederick Douglass are still relevant. It is not light that we need, but fire. It is not a gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. We invite you today to join with us for the coming storm that will bring the change that helps us grow and makes us stronger. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Diana Robinson, coordinator of our union semester program. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys, for that introduction. Um, welcome everyone to our panel, Black Workers in the Triple Pandemic. Um, at this time, uh, this is an important conversation uh, for us to have. Um, but but bef before we begin this conversation, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on, indigenous land, wherever we are, um, we are an indigenous land and recognizing that is important. In addition to that, I'd like us to have a moment of silence for all the lives that have been lost in this struggle for racial justice and um, in many other struggles um, in the labor movement. So if we could please take a few minutes uh, uh, to hold a moment of silence. Thank you again for joining us for this important conversation. As uh, Dean Gladys mentioned, my name is Diana Robinson. I'm the coordinator of the Union Semester Program at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, and it's my great honor and pleasure to be able to be part of this important conversation. Um, we know that um, this is not new. Uh, black workers and Black people have of often experienced oppression in this country. Uh, from the beginning of our country, this has been happening. And so our panelists are gonna be discussing what are some ways that we are confronting this? What are some ways that we can build power to uh, fight against racial justice? And what are some lessons that we can learn from from the past in, um, in fights for reform? Uh, so I'm excited to hear from our panelists. Um, so I'd like to introduce, um, and one other thing before we begin, uh, for questions and answers, uh, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom. You can add your questions there. We'll have staff from SLU that will be moderating the question and answer. We'll have ample time at the end of the panelists' presentations uh, to answer as many questions as time allows. Um, so our panelists are, uh, professor Clarence Taylor, uh, Professor Emeritus at Baruch College. 
Um, in addition to that, he recently published um, a book, Fight the Power, about the history of police brutality here in the US. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Michelle Crinstall, the political director at the New York State Nurses Association. Uh, we're also going to be hearing from April Sims, secretary treasurer of the Washington State AFL-CIO, Maurice Weeks, co-executive director of the Action Center on Race and the Economy, Courtney Sebring, uh, creative communications director at BYP 100. Um, so, Thank you again for joining us, and um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Clarence Taylor. I, I think you're muted. Can you hear me? Great, okay, well thank you for uh inviting me here for this extremely important uh, discussion. Now, what has become clear to millions of people in this country and around the world these last few months is how racism determines the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and police brutality are having on the Black working class. Black and brown workers are dying in greater numbers from COVID-19 more than any other group due to structural inequality and racism that has shaped every institution in this country. While some argue that people are dying, black and brown people are dying, uh, is due to the fact that they have more risk factors, it has become clear to millions that the high proportion of essential workers are black and okay. brown people. You have a minute. Uh, Nadia, you're, you're not muted. Uh, it has become clear to millions that the high proportion of essential workers are black and brown people, exposing them more to, to others with virus. They can't work from home and they are more likely than others to have no health insurance or inferior healthcare coverage. Unemployment among black and Latinos is high because many are low paid workers who were the first to be fired. 40% of those who lost their jobs earned $40,000 or less. And black people have been systematically targeted by the police agencies throughout the United States. Although the number of black victims of the triple pandemic are staggering, this is not new. This is not a new story. Throughout its entire existence, the black working class has been the victims of racial discrimination and class exploitation, denying them employment or relegating them uh, to employment that was low, uh, essentially offering low pay wages. It denied black workers proper health coverage. When hundreds of thousands of blacks fled the South in opposition to racial terror looking for better economic and social opportunities during the Great Migration. These Black workers face an enormous amount of racial hostilities. Black migrant workers were hired in industry, but they were given the lowest paying jobs thanks to company policy, union exclusion, and white workers' resentment. And to make matters worse, as I noted, labor unions excluded Black workers thus denying them the same protections from employees that white, work, white workers receive. But the end of World War I, by the end of World War I, black workers were fired en masse, thus unemployment soared among the black proletariat. The Brooklyn Urban League, for example, reported that black unemployment reached a six-year high by 1920. The racial hostility to the black working class by the larger white society was on full display by the end of World War I. Numerous racial assaults took place in cities throughout the North and West, as well as the South. In 1919, the so-called Red Summer, 25 racial attacks on black people took place, including Chicago, Washington, DC, St. Louis, and where I live, Syracuse, New York. The worst racial massacre took place 
of course, in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. The Tulsa massacre and other vicious displays of racial terror sent the message to black people that white America could do anything it wanted to uh, to them with impunity and no, enlost, no law enforcement agency, be it federal, state, or local, was going to protect them. The denial of decent jobs and the numerous racial assaults on the black working class were not the only horrors they experienced. By the 1930s, they went through the process of ghettoization, leading to unhealthy living conditions. Realtors, banks, white home associations, and the federal government, as well as local governments, were partners in forcing black people into overcrowded, dilapidated, unsanitary, depressing housing with practically no meaningful public services, including health care, which led to an enormous amount of black death. The rates of all kinds of diseases was far higher among blacks than whites. From 1936 to 1940, Harlem's annual death rate was close to 16 per 1,000, while the city's death rate was 10.2. Heart disease, pneumonia, and tuberculosis were the leading cause of death. The mortality rate from pneumonia in Harlem was 122.4 per thousand between 1936 and 1940, but 68.1, excuse me, 68.4% one and a half times lower for white New Yorkers. Nationally, life expectancy for white women in 1950 was 72.2, while for black women, it was 62.9. The lack of health care for black workers was not the only cause of death. Black people suffered from what journalist Glenn Ford called the blue plague. As Ford notes, the blue plague is a pathogen that kills black people at two and a half times the rate of whites. One of the most constant grievances of black people has been in this, in this country has been the subjugation by law enforcement. Policing is one of the longest civil rights issues faced by black people. Harry Hayward, one of the earliest black members of the American Communist Party wrote that in the early 1930s, the Chicago police held the record for terror and lawlessness against black workers. He asserted that they were unsurpassed in their brutality. Chicago was not unique in his family in New York as well as in other places to police were an arm of the state that launched the reign of terror against black people. In his book, The Negro Revolt, the reporter Louis Lomax wrote that it was an aggravated in areas like Harlem where police brutality is an accepted fact of life. And the Amsterdam News, the largest black weekly uh, in New York, noted that in 1940s and 1950s, there wasn't a week that went by that the paper was not informed about the excessive uh, force used by the police on black citizens. But an important part of the story of black suffering is the gallant fight by the black working class and its allies to eradicate systematic racism and inequality. Because of the limited time, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not able to discuss the ways black workers launched a fight against the various forms of racial oppression but is an essential part of the story. From their role of helping to destroy the system of slavery, the Southern Black working class fleeing the Southern apartheid system, and Black workers in the 1920s and on who joined or created organizations actively opposing all forms of racial, economic, and at times gender oppression, including police brutality. The Black working class have not done well in the current crisis, but that has never, they have never done well. And the cause of the current suffering as activists have always noted will never be solved unless systematic racism and structural inequality have been eradicated. I think that's under 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Clarence Taylor. Uh, thank you for that historical perspective of the struggles that uh, Black uh, workers and Black people have faced in the United States, criminalization by the police, 
uh, not having equal rights under the law and um, even being excluded from unions at one point. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Michelle Krinsel, uh, the political director at the New York State Nurses Association. Thanks for the intro. Um, so I didn't necessarily prepare as much of like a written program, but I did take a bunch of notes um, and kind of wanted to just speak uh, from the experience of coming into this role at the New York State Nurses Association, NISNA, as we call it. Um, I actually started at NISNA um, at the end of March. I believe it was the second day of uh, the lockdown. Um, so, you know, right in the thick of things, definitely not an easy time. Um, but I was, you know, I think I'm still inspired and in awe of the nurses and members of NISNA who really um, just really kind of courageously braved through this, um, you know, this crisis, this uh, pandemic, um, and not with the support that they deserved, to be honest, um, from the responses from the state, responses locally, responses federally, obviously, um, I think what essential workers um, were forced to do was really um, make incredible sacrifices to protect um, various communities. And I think, frankly, um, a lot of the institutions in place that were supposed to be supporting them let them down. Um, and so what I mean by that, I think, you know, we're really experiencing the intersection of three major crises that um, often don't even happen in like a lifetime, right? Like, I don't know. I can, I don't know anyone in um, my family who was alive during another global pandemic, but, um, you know, seeing that pandemic come in, but then also now seeing the economic crisis that has been exacerbated, honestly, by um, the health pandemic. I don't think it was, you know, totally new. Um, I think it's been exacerbated by it. And then, of course, seeing the uprisings that have um, reignited the fight um, for um, the fight and the movement for Black Lives. Um, and so I think kind of looking at those three things and also seeing race very central to those, right? Um, coming into the pandemic, uh, especially here in New York, uh, there was already um, kind of a uh, divestment or disinvestment in um, healthcare and the services that communities of color, black communities and working people need, right? We've seen cuts um, to healthcare. We've seen the closure of hospitals. We've seen the decrease in beds, right? And what we've seen is a healthcare system that has been maximized for profit, but not necessarily actually built for the care that everyone needs. Um, and so when we had this pandemic raging through the state, raging through downstate, especially through the city, um, you know, the capacity wasn't there to actually care for everyone. Um, and people were stretched. You know, so one of the things that NISA has been fighting for for a long time is staffing ratios, right? Like enough staffing, enough nurses to actually take care of the patients, right? And this became even further a problem as nurses were getting sick because they weren't properly protected. They didn't have the PPE that they had been demanding from jump. Um, you know, they already had given sort of like the warning, uh, the warning signs of like the warning calls that we need all this protective equipment. This is going to be really bad. So nurses were getting sick. They were unfortunately dying. Um, and then they were stretched for staff, right, um, to take care of patients. And it was a huge kind of um, psychological burden to understanding that you could not provide the care that people needed because there weren't enough of you. You know, a lot of the nurses um, as a part of NISA had to go through that. Um, but I think sort of coming back to the racial justice lens, um, looking at these impacts of COVID on black communities, looking at the sort of like racialized death gap in the way, in a way, um, you know, it's, it's something that's been sort of, um, created and exasperated by, um, or exacerbated by, uh, political choices, right? Um, I think some of that's austerity, uh, whether there have been cuts to healthcare and cuts to other services that um, actually care for people um, and not necessarily a robust investment into a caring economy um, per se, um, that sort of, you know, didn't set us up well um, to handle a pandemic like this, right? Um, we came in with already um, a threat of major cuts to Medicaid um, that impacts the, um, obviously the public health care system impacts the um, social safety net, which were overwhelmingly serving communities of color and black communities, and also have um, often overwhelmingly black and brown staff. Um, and something that we noticed early on as some of the um, nurses, unfortunately, 
um, were passing away. Um, it started off, it was uh, mostly members in the public health system and h and &H, and they were black and brown. Those are the people who died. Um, and that's something that, you know, we are committed to fighting against. And so I think things that set, sort of seem more hopeful right now, um, I think there was a real demand for solidarity um, amongst uh, essential workers because protecting workers meant protecting communities. Um, if we were not protecting the essential workers who had to care for people and had to interface with the public, that meant that they were becoming vectors for the disease, right? And so there was a real imperative that when nurses were fighting for PPE, they were also fighting for PPE for grocery store workers, for grocery clerks, for delivery workers, for all of this. It wasn't just for them. They knew that we had to protect all communities. Um, and, you know, I think as someone had said, the uh, sort of disproportionate representation of black and brown people as essential workers, it really was a fight to protect um, black and brown communities. Uh, so I think sort of seeing that militancy around that, um, you know, we had nurses in the street protesting about it. Um, I think that has been hopeful. Um, seeing a lot of our nurses be involved in the movement for Black Lives and reignited through that, that also, I think, is something that we can be really hopeful about. Um, and so I think really what needs to happen, um, or at least kind of sort of how Nisman is thinking about it, you know, to really confront these crises um, and looking at this systemic racial and social inequality that has existed, um, you know, there are a couple of things that we sort of just, you know, full stop have a position on, um, and that's healthcare is a right, right, that um, must be equally provided to all um, with, without regard to race, anything, like we need healthcare, we need to expand healthcare. Um, also, everyone deserves to leave, live free of state violence and just racism, discrimination, any of that. Like, it's actually killing people. Um, and we need to really prioritize building an economy that cares for people and that doesn't um, use punishment, incarceration, violence, force to actually address issues that it doesn't even address. Like, it's not even effective at addressing, right? Um, so that's something that we've been um, really uh, talking about internally um, and educating with uh, NISNA members and hoping to sort of use our voice as um, organized healthcare workers um, to really sort of comment on the fact that these crises didn't have to um, sort of play out the way that they did, but that we have an opportunity to moving forward to really, um, you know, protect the front lines, invest in the communities that we've divested from for so long um and reject austerity so that we don't have to keep making these political choices that kill black and brown people because that's what happens um i think it's something we've known it's something that these crises are only further exposing um but we really have the tools and the organizations to fight back um and so i think nice is really excited to be a part of that fight i think the nurses are really excited to be a part of that fight um and i thank you for having me thanks Thanks, Michelle. Uh, one quick question uh, that maybe you can address is, uh, how do you think um, NISNA or just the labor movement in general can, um, can kind of build an anti-racist framework around organizing and engaging with their members? How can unions educate their members around anti-racism? So I think it's a, a couple of things. Um, one, I think it's actually committing to do it. Um, and that has to come from members that has to come from the leadership of the organization and not just from and I know this might sound like kind of rough or harsh or anything not just from kind of a moralistic like oh it's a nice thing to do like we shouldn't be racist oh my god um but as a strategic imperative for the organization right like anti-racism should be a part of you know unions the labor movement for a you know, for a strategic reason, right? Like if we're trying to build power amongst working people, that includes black people and people of color. <laughs> if we are divided amongst that, then we're not gonna be able to build the power to actually win the things that we need. So there's actually a strategic imperative behind that. And I think in terms of the, you know, being able to put forth anti-racist education with members, I think there's a really important, um, there's a really important point to make when we're talking about why this is important, why it's strategic, and why it speaks to power, right? Um, I think there are some people who will get it and there are some people who won't. And so I think that's another thing is understanding that there might be some really gnarly, ugly pushback um, from folks who really don't get it. But 
you got to keep it moving, right? You got to stay committed to this and keeping the message really clear because I think there's a lot of people who, um, even within, you know, NISNA, there are a lot of people who are so excited that we've taken a stand on this, right? And are actually moving with intention about it and they've been vocal about it. There's some people who are like, I'm not sure where I'm at. And so we're committing to really educate on that um, and connecting it to their issues and self-interest and what is going on in their facilities um and in their communities and there's some people you know what they might not get on board but what's interesting is this is actually going to benefit them in the long run too so we'll keep it moving thank you so much michelle um oh, sorry um so our um i just want to remind everyone again that if you have any questions please feel free to put them in the qa q a function if you look at your screen, if you go to the more button, uh, you can go to the Q&A and you can post any questions you'll have there. Um, we're gonna be uh, gathering all the questions and uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. We have allotted a good amount of time uh, for participants to engage with the panelists. Uh, so please visit the Q&A and post any questions you might have there. In addition, in the chat, you can follow along with some important information about our panelists, uh, recent projects that they've worked on, articles, um, so please follow along there as well. Um, next, we're gonna hear from April Sims, uh, the Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State AFL-CIO. Good morning um, or afternoon, depending on uh, where you are and where you're participating in this panel from. Um, I wanna thank the organizers first for inviting me to be uh, a part of this important conversation and a member of this amazing panel. I've already made some notes and learned a number of things, so it's really exciting to be here. Um, I'm April Sims, she, her pronouns. I'm proud to serve as Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. We are the largest labor organization in Washington State. We represent over 600 locals and affiliates and over a half a million workers and their families um, in all industries and sectors across the state of Washington. I think um, without a doubt, we are witnessing uh, a raised consciousness and an overwhelming call to acknowledge and dismantle uh, the racism and the inequities that are baked into our institutions. All of our institutions, um, our labor unions included. And I wanna spend my time talking about the work that we're doing here in Washington State to clean our own house and to hold each other accountable to the highest ideas of our movement which is the language in the preamble of our constitution that charges us with fighting the forces that seek to enslave the human soul. So I wanna give you a little bit of background and some history on the work that we've been doing, talk about where we are now, and then share a little bit of uh, our vision for the work ahead. So by way of background and history, I think it's first, uh, I wanna lift up a few things about our state because I think there's this uh, narrative that I hear whenever I'm traveling outside of the state that Washington is you know, some sort of liberal mecca, that we have large democratic majorities and folks with really strong progressive values. But the reality is we have some really conservative areas of our state and a lot of union members who identify as either fiscally or socially conservative. Um, so as a state, I would say we're more purple than blue, politically speaking. Um, and I say that just, you know, to, to say that, you know, the streets are not paved in progressive gold in Washington state. Uh, policymakers, uh, lawmakers are not making it rain good policy for workers, families, and communities. And um, we are probably the most passive aggressive state in the nation. And that's only because we beat the state of Oregon in a highly contested game of rock, paper, scissors. That's a joke. I can't, no, I don't know if y'all are laughing. I don't know how this is landing on y'all. I'm just going to keep moving. Um, so I say that because in 2015, when Black Lives Matter activists um, interrupted uh, Bernie Sanders' social security rally that we were having here um, in Seattle, people were outraged and that Pacific Northwest passive aggressive racism was out in full display. Um, folks were saying things like, you know, I, I agree with what they're saying. I just don't like the way they did it. So um, now they don't have my support. And this racial divide was compounded by the fact that the rally was organized and supported by the labor community. So despite the fact that interruption is a tactic of our movement, um, there were folks that were really pushing back on the interruption of this event. So we knew we had a lot of work to do. 
Um, our work started in 2015 with a resolution that passed our convention calling on then president of the Washington State Labor Council, Jeff Johnson, to appoint a special committee to take up AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka's call to have a serious and open-ended conversation about what we can do and what we should do regarding race and the labor movement. The result of that work was the creation of a race and labor program, which is an initiative that we have been working on since 2016. We developed a full day training that walks participants through the manifestations of racism, how it shows up in our workplace and in our unions, um, the history of racism in our country and in our movement, um, implicit bias and differentials in treatment, which, you know, spoiler alert, that's code for white privilege. Um, how to interrupt oppressive moments as individuals, and how to interrupt the system and change our institutions through organizing, collective bargaining, um, union culture, and community partnerships. So we created a train the trainer curriculum um, to try to move the program to scale and offered our first train the trainer workshops in 2017. Um, in 2017, we trained more than 100 leaders and staff um, in how to deliver this curriculum. It was an important first step to starting the conversation, um, exposing members, leaders, um, and staff to new concepts and language, concepts like white supremacy and systemic racism. Um, but it wasn't enough. We needed to figure out how to provide real institutional support for the program. Um, what were the deliverables? What were the measurables? So in 2017, we passed another resolution called Race and Labor 2.0, um, which was ambitious and called on us to certify 30 trainers in the curriculum, um, uh, to have all of our executive board and staff of our affiliates uh, participate in the training, 50% um, by 2018, 70% by 2019, and 100% by uh, 2020. We held um, additional train the trainer workshops and a race and labor summit with more than 100 young workers of color to provide some di direction and identify best practices for how we would move this work forward. Um, in 2019, delegates passed uh, race and labor 3.0, um, which really called on us to provide some institutional support for the program to create a campaign and propose a budget for this work. Um, to create a racial justice committee, um, to do some demographic data on members, staff, and leaders by 2022, um, and to figure out how we fund a full-time position to do this work. Uh, so where we are now, um, I think the, the concepts and the language that I mentioned around white supremacy and systemic racism have really helped us navigate conversations in this moment. Um, we are sponsoring race-based caucuses for our staff and our leaders. Um, we're in the process of creating a director of racial and gender justice position that will drive this work, which is a big commitment um, as we're moving into an uncertain economic future. It shows that we are really prioritizing this work um, and building a real budget for the program. We're revamping our train the trainer program and curriculum so that we can in increase capacity. Um, and, you know, it's led to conversations about policing and police unions um, in our movement and how we hold each other accountable um, to our highest ideas. Um, conversations about how racism is rooted in anti-Blackness, um, conversations about our responsibility to center the experience of people of color, specifically Black workers in the work that we're doing moving forward. Um, and that brings me to the vision for the work of the work ahead. I think we really have a vision at the Washington State Labor Council that this work will impact a real culture change. Uh, we know that culture um, eats strategy for breakfast, so we can strategize around these things until the moon explodes. But if we're not doing real work to change our culture, we'll never really see um, the dramatic changes that we need to see in our labor movement if we want to build a more inclusive, stronger, fighting labor movement, one that all workers feel like they can be a part of. Um, so even in these unprecedented times, this you know, global pandemic that's threatening our communities, a pending recession, um, an increased economic hardship, and a resurgence of the centuries old quest uh, for racial justice, um, we are in a moment. Um, and many of us recognize that this is a moment. Uh, we know that moments lead to movements and movements can change the world, but we have to figure out how we squeeze every drop of progress from this moment because for many of us of color, we know that this moment may not last long. Um, and that for most black folks, these challenges are nothing new. Um, 
this is business as usual for many of us. And we know that our ancestors had to survive so much just for us to get here. Um, and we know that resiliency is our heritage because we're survivors. But I think my vision for the work ahead is that we, uh, we have more than that for our movement and more than that for our people, that we don't just survive this moment and survive these crises, that, but that we, that we thrive, right? And being able to thrive is going to take real uh, systemic change. So uh, the vision for the work ahead is, uh, is this culture shift. And I know that this is possible. And this, I think, is what's giving me hope in this moment. Um, because young people are leading the way. And every time I hear someone say that, oh, these young people are so entitled, I think, yes, right? Like, what are we fighting for? What have we been fighting for, if not for this next generation to feel like they're entitled to some more stuff than we had, um, that they don't have to fight the same battles that we fought? and that we are leaving um, a stronger legacy for them. So the vision for the work ahead is really a wider path that some of us, especially uh, leaders of color, black women specifically, um, some of us are following a narrow path that was laid out by those who came before us. And the vision for the work ahead is that we widen the path, um, that those of us with the institutional and the positional power use it to create more opportunities for the folks who are fighting alongside us and those who will come behind us. So I thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about the work that we're doing and to be a member of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, April. Uh, thank you for sharing all the work that you all are doing um, at the Labor Council in Washington State. Um, that commitment to doing the education work and also kind of, you know, um, really being intentional about it, it's really important. And I'm glad you shared uh, those models and the programs that you all are doing that we could all learn from. Next, we're gonna hear from Maurice Weeks, um, the co-executive director of the Action Center on Race and the Economy. Hey y'all, um, and thank you so much uh, for having me on this very esteemed panel. Um, it's always tough following April, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, uh, so I want to talk briefly, oh, again, my name is Maurice, I use he and him pronouns, I'm the co-executive director of, of the Action Center on Race and the Economy. We're a campaigns hub, we help out uh, organizations that are doing uh, campaigns on anything that has to do with sort of finance and the economy uh, as it relates to racial justice issues. So I want to um, talk about how this pandemic in particular weighs on budgets and the long-term uh, implications of it as such, um, especially in how those things sort of intersect. Um, and I'm gonna start with the nature of police budgets in particular. So um, I know that we all have, uh, many of us have likely been in the streets actually um, yelling about defunding the police, um, uh, present company included, and why uh, that is primarily, um, why that's a very important thing to do in this moment. Um, and I wanna stress that that's, before I sort of get into it, that that's primarily an important thing for the structural change and the power that the police have and as a step towards abolishing the police altogether. Um, and the primary argument there is not an economic one. We don't wanna sort of cut their budgets and then make them more efficient. Um, we wanna actually structurally challenge their power and that's kind of the root of the, the defund messaging. Um, However, as an important exercise of just how powerful the police currently are, you can look at their budgets, you know, that saying that, you know, budgets are moral documents. Um, so I'm actually gonna share my screen um, to show a new tool that we just developed that uh, digs into the morals of uh, the top 300 cities by population in the United States. Um, I'm gonna pick on a couple of cities in particular um, just because they're at the top of my mind. And I think that they um, are good examples, um, different cities in terms of both size, parts of the country they're in, demographics, uh, culture, et cetera. Um, so let me hope that the screen share works. Um, it actually says it's been disabled by the host. If one of the co-hosts can make me a co-host, it would solve the problem. Thanks, Maurice, we're gonna work on it. Um, so as I get into that, I can kind of explain how we created this tool. So we uh, 
our uh, researchers went in and went into the budget documents of um, every single city of the top 300 cities in the country. We went and looked at their most recent confirmed budget, um, and then we crunched some numbers to find lots of different things, and the first of which we're sort of releasing is the, just the percentages of, uh, of how big those, those, um, those budgets are as they relate to the overall city's budget. Um, so you should be able to see my screen now, and I'm going to start with the city of Los Angeles just because the number is so unbelievably big. So, uh, and you can, if you go onto the site, it's costofpolice.org. You can um, play around in it yourself. So um, Los Angeles, their overall budget is about $5.3 billion. That's billion with a B. They spend 52% of that on the police. Um, so uh, you might think, you know, what could you possibly spend $2.7 billion on when it comes to the police? Well, there are a tremendous amount of uh, Los Angeles police officers, of course. Um, if you've ever been to LA, you see them literally everywhere. Uh, but also LA is, um, has bought lots of other things for the police. So they have multiple uh, tanks, they have multiple aircrafts, they have, uh, you know, all sorts of weaponry that uh, you certainly do not need in order, uh, in order to just peacefully um, uh, run any sort of public service department. I'm going to go to where I live, which is Detroit, Michigan, obviously way smaller budget than, than Los Angeles, but still pretty sizable, spending 30% on our police. This is a city that is uh, it's, it's extremely black and also still recovering from um, you know, being one of the hardest hit cities as it, as it relates to the last recession. Um, and that chunk, nearly a third of our budget going the pol to the police really prevents us from doing a tremendous amount of, of uh, good things in, in our city. Finally, I'll just look at Tulsa, Oklahoma, just because it's been in the news, um, a city that's a little bit different than uh, the first two, 36% on the police. So Tulsa has a housing crisis. There's all sorts of infrastructure needs there and spending over a third on their, um, on their police budget. Um, so you can see that you know, all of these cities that we know need more services and have the ability to provide these services, but instead pour millions and millions, in one case billions, into the police budget. Uh, New York, which wasn't featured, has a $6 billion police budget. Um, and it shows you just how embedded policing is in the very fabric of our government and that there's no path to reform here that it must be abolished. So we should know that, of course, whenever money is involved, that Wall Street, one of my number one villains, will take advantage. So my organization recently released a report uh, on what we titled police brutality bonds, which are uh, bond instruments that cities issue to pay police brutality settlements. Um, those settlements are crucially important and almost always lower than they should be. Um, someone has just gone through an unbelievably traumatic event or you've lost a family member. Um, and uh, so this sort of, uh, so we highlight this to really show, um, you know, how embedded this really, the, the nature of policing is in our society and the fact that um, we have to be focus on, focusing on abolishing the police and really uh, changing the economic system that we're in because capitalism will always look for profit even if it's at the expense of black death. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll say that, uh, you know, the, the real cost to the budget and society of police is likely to go um, way farther than the numbers that you'll see on this website, costofpolice.org, um, or if you go and look up your own city budget, in, in case it's not on that website. For one, our site doesn't feature um, budgets about prisons or correctional facilities, and we know that once we add those numbers in, uh, some of the cities jump up tremendously in terms of percentage. Um, and also, you know, and this is sort of a, another reason why we think that the defunding the police is not merely an economic argument, it often doesn't include things like surveillance cameras or individuals who play a role of pseudo police who just sort of connect the police to, to incidents that are happening. Um, Police are, policing, um, the nature of policing is woven into so many different parts of our budget that it's actually difficult to get all of the other pieces in for particular places. So one of the things that Acre is working on is a broader analysis of what the total cost of policing is in a few places that we hope to release soon. 
This, of course, all sits on top of a pandemic that is poised to widen the wealth gap. On April 1st, about a third of the renters in the country didn't pay rent. That number was likely higher on June 1st as the peanuts that the government gave folks faded away. Um, and we hear that no more um, assistance is coming. For black communities especially that lost so much during the foreclosure crisis, something that I saw up, up close and personal at the housing organization I worked with during in that time, we know that the next hit is gonna mean a extreme rise in homelessness and death and ruins lives and broken families um, and uh, maybe a spread further of the pandemic as well. Um, so we have to be pushing for uh, rent to be canceled and other housing solutions. Um, and then finally, if we're gonna get through any of these three crises, um, you know, as Michelle and others have said, black folks are dying at uh, disproportionate rates and are the ones who are being put at risk actually for a, a small period of time. The unemployment gap, which has been this historical indicator of how racist the country is, closed because black and brown workers were the ones who were um, doing those essential jobs, those risky jobs that were keeping us all all safe. It's now, as people are starting to open back up, widened and probably going to widen even greater as the black employees who were laid off are likely not to be hired back in many cases. Um, so if we're going to uh, you know, make it through these crises, we need to dismantle the systems that are in reality and also in our head and take that police are not keeping us safe, they don't serve the working class, um, and they're not workers and they need to be abolished, that uh, Wall Street can't save us from any uh, problems that we have uh, and that we need to fund communities. We already have the solution for how to do things like, um, you know, educate children properly. You actually just need to pay for that. Um, it's all, I've laid it out all so simply at the end here. It's obviously extremely difficult, but that's what we need to push towards if we're going to have um, a society following this. Thank you, Maurice, um, for kind of uh, destigmatizing that, right? Because when you hear defend the police, a lot of people have a hard time understanding what that looks like, what that can mean, um, and they feel like it's just not feasible. Um, so I appreciate you breaking, breaking that down and, and kind of sharing those numbers. Um, so again, I want to remind folks, you can look in the chat. Uh, we're posting relevant information. Uh, you could look up uh, Acres campaigns. Um, and what Maurice was referring to um, on his screen. Um, so our next speaker that we're going to be hearing from is Courtney Sebring. Um, she's the Creative Communications Director at BYP 100. Hello. Um, thank you all for having me. I'm so grateful to be here and be learning from um, these brilliant panelists as well. So thank you for pulling us together. Um, my name is Courtney Sebring. I use she, her pronouns. And like, the, um, like was said, I'm the Creative Communications Director at BYP 100. BYP 100 is a national Black activist member-based organization of 18 to 35-year-olds fighting for the liberation of all Black people. Um, we do this through direct action, organizing, electoral organizing, policy advocacy, political education, and leadership development through a Black queer feminist lens that centers the most marginalized in our communities. We're in 10 cities across the country, um, Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, DC, Detroit, Durham, Jackson, Mississippi, Milwaukee, New Orleans, and New York, and we're growing. Um, and so I'm here to share um, a local fight and win that continues to give me hope for our future and actually um, plays very well off of Maurice's um, offering to us today around police budgets. Um, and so I live in Durham, North Carolina, uh, a small and rowdy um, radical city. Um, and in 2016, or organizers in the city got word that um, the police chief um, and, the, and the city manager were proposing $71 million to be invested in a, a brand new police headquarters um, in low-income black communities in our city. Um, and it felt like an immediate, an immediate harm to our people in a city that has a housing crisis, in a city that evicts the most black women in the state. Um, it felt like an unacceptable way to use the city's resources and, and immediately folks were in the streets. Um, a group called the Say Her Name Collective um, that was fighting against the uh, gender-based violence in our communities, BYP 100's local chapter, um, Southerners on New Ground, the Dangerous Homosexuals of the South, and our local UA 150 chapter 
um, the Public Service Workers Union came together um, to oppose this $71 million headquarters. Uh, we went door to door in our neighborhoods and rallied outside of city council for weeks um, and carried this petition that said, um, if we could decide how the $71 million was spent, what would we do with it? Uh, we asked people um, and, and shared with them that if the city gave all of this money to Durham communities instead, we would each have $300. What would you do with your $300 to keep our people safe? And most people said things like rent. They would pay their rent or they would work towards affordable housing. They would pay off student lunch debt, which is also a huge problem. Um, they would make the city buses free, add more beds to local shelters because we are out of them. They would bail out a loved one from jail because our people can't afford to get out. No one said police. And it was so clear that in the community in Durham believes that meeting our people's needs keeps us safe and not police. Um, and so with this amazing coalition partnership between young black organizers, queer organizers in the city, faith-based leaders in the city and public service workers, um, we mounted a significant amount of public pressure on the city council before their budgeting decision. Um, and we were demanding a a living wage for our city workers, as well as an end to this police, um, to this new police headquarters. Um, and while we lost the fight to stop the headquarters from being built, our public pressure won a $15, a $15 minimum wage for full-time city workers. Um, and we saw our power to change the lives of working class people in our communities. Um, the coalition came back together in 2019 to defeat another proposal for 72 more officers in our city. Uh, and in and, and that time, we won an eviction diversion program for our people, we won funding for that. Um, and we came back and won $15 minimum wage for our seasonal and part-time public service workers. Um, and so when, when we're thinking about how to harness the, the momentum of this uprising to defend Black life and, and how to build possibilities in this triple pandemic where cops, COVID, and capitalism are, are hurting and killing our people, um, we find power in building across communities and across movements, demanding and fighting for what all of our families need to survive. Um, I have seen um, the future that we're fighting for in our lifetime, in my lifetime. Um, I've seen us practicing meeting each other's needs and actions across the country and the world. Um, and another example is uh, in DC, actions with BYP 100 DC and Black Lives Matter DC. Um, build wellness centers into their actions. And these look like tables overflowing with food um, and water and hygiene supplies and first aid support and other spiritual wellness offerings. Um, things that black, brown and white working class communities um, are in a constant struggle for. Things that our people sometimes can't access. Um, and things that our people can't access in a world where police are funded over our survival needs and our futures. Um, I've seen us leaning into each other for safety, building networks into our neighborhoods to respond to harm without the police, calling each other instead. I've seen us redistributing resources uh, from our communities to feed each other and to fund black freedom movements because we all know that this $1,200 stimulus did not sustain our families in this crisis. I've seen us practicing radical inclusivity and fighting for the freedom of all black people centering black women and girls, caregivers, queer and trans folks, and sex workers, disabled folks, and immunocompromised folks. And we need way more, vo we need way more voices carrying this message, but it gives me so much hope um, to see Fannie Lou Hamer's words almost every day now, that nobody's free until everybody's free. And so in the future that we're fighting for, um, the curiosity and brilliance of all black children is protected and is nourished Every Black family has access to safe housing, to clean water, to healthy food, and affirming education. We have bodily autonomy and access to quality health care, including reproductive care. We have access to, to care for the land and to receive the gifts that the land offers back to us. We have access to each other across languages, freedom to move across borders, without borders. And we never fear again that our loved ones will end up in a cage or killed by the police. So I'm really appreciative of this conversation um, and, and offer to folks that when we think about where can these, what, what will we do without police? What will our lives look like without police? I encourage people to think about this question. What do our people 
look like when we have all of our needs met? What does our family feel like? What does our family have um, when we have all of our needs met? Do we feel safer when we have food, water, housing, um, love, and bodily autonomy? Um, and that's where we start when we talk about this conversation of abolition and defunding the police um, and protecting workers' rights, Black workers' rights, um, and, and fighting for our access to healthcare. It starts with um, us believing that freedom is our birthright and that all of these things we deserve already. And that's what we're fighting for at BYP 100. Um, this woman is teaching me again that we are truly unstoppable and that another world is possible in our lifetimes. Um, I think I'm early, um, but if there's a question, I would love yeah. to answer one. Uh, thanks so much, Courtney, um, for sharing that vision. It's such a beautiful vision. And uh, the words, those words are so true. We aren't all free until we're all free. Um, and so, Courtney, I want to ask you, because oftentimes I, I feel like when we're talking about whether it's a labor movement or other social justice movement, um, you know, youth voices or young adult voices aren't often part of that conversation. Uh, so can, can you talk more about kind of um, how you all at BYP 100 um, are ensuring that, that those voices are heard and they're part of that, that um, movement building because you know, these issues and what's going on directly impacts young adults. And so can you talk a little bit more about that, why it's important to include the voices of youth in these conversations? Absolutely. Um, so we are a youth organization of 18 to 35 year old folks um, because we believe that um, this world historically leaves uh, young people behind. Um, and one of the ways that we are combating that is through um, political education and leadership development of our folks um, and also going to and meeting our people where they're at. Um, young Black people, young brown people, young folks who are marginalized in the society um, understand this world um, understand what they deserve and are ready to speak on it when we, when we give them the opportunity. Um, and so we're creating our own platforms, we're creating our own networks, um, and we're giving more, um, more amplification to the voices of young, Black, queer, and trans folks, um, sex workers, uh, folks who are formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated. Um, and it really starts with um, just connecting with those people um, and, and offering more spaces of, of leadership development and political education. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so uh, before um, we move on uh, to the uh, Q&A section, um, there are a few questions that I, I'd like the panelists to uh, address. Um, so my first question is for Clarence, uh, Professor Clarence Taylor. Um, what can we learn from former movements for reform? Um, what can we learn for this current moment, uh, lessons learned from those former movements? Well, I think one important lesson that we, we have to take away is that <clears throat> the opposition to <clears throat> our movements are extremely fierce. And lots of times we don't win because uh, that opposition is well organized. And I'll give you uh, an example of 1966 in New York City, where a, a liberal Republican mayor, John Lindsay, was elected and promised to create the, a civilian complaint review board consisting of four police officers excuse me, four civilians and three police officers. The decision to um, investigate cold hearings would be uh, in the hands of this board. And in the end, the board would just make a recommendation if the, the officer was found guilty or needed discipline, would make a, a, a recommendation to the police commissioner. And in the end, the police commissioner would decide. That was too much for the police, too much for then what was called the Patrolman Benevolence Association. And they launched a fierce campaign 
a racist campaign to dismantle that review board. And they won. They managed to uh, get a referendum on a, a ballot and ask New Yorkers to vote against the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And it was defeated by a three to one margin, but using these racist tactics, scaring white New Yorkers that if you have the Civilian Complaint Review Board, you would tie the hands of the police and the black criminals will run wild. It was at that moment, by the way, I think for, for many police departments throughout the nation, they learned not only that they had a tremendous amount of police power, but they also had a tremendous amount of political power. And so that game has been played, that scenario, that false narrative has been played ever since. Every time there's an attempt to uh, even small, small, recommendations and reforms. That's why they don't work, by the way. That's why they never work. And so I think that's an important lesson we can learn from the past, that uh, the opposition to um, our you know, policing and other ways of uh, eradicating uh, these uh, racist institutions, you know, just be, well, be aware that you know, the opposition will uh, be fierce. Thank you, Professor Taylor. Uh, I'd like to invite the other panelists if you uh, want to also address this question, kind of what can we learn from past moves for reform, whether it's around police reform or, or other reforms uh, for dismantling uh, white supremacy and structural racism um, in our country. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I think one lesson that I always take from, uh, you know, stories of, of of uh, elders' fights um, is that like to be very scrutinous of the win and to also like continue to fight after the win. <laughs> so I could actually imagine, um, uh, in fact, there's an example that folks often um, have been citing recently around um, abolish the police work of Camden, New Jersey. Um, and Camden, New Jersey got rid of their police department but if you walked around Camden, New Jersey, you actually wouldn't know that. Camden, New Jersey is not like suddenly an oasis because they dismantled their police department. They actually just had another police force take over the department. I would still get pulled over at the same rate that I did before in Camden, New Jersey. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there, it's possible to be in a situation where we think that we have won um, but we have to be very scrutinous to, to like make sure that whatever the win is matches our values. And then, I mean, like Clarence was saying, like the other side is going to continue to fight too. Like this is, they, they get a vote, you know? Um, so we have to make sure that we continue to fight as well. Yeah, and um, I'll just jump in, uh, kind of piling on to what you had said, Maurice, where uh, I think being scrutinous of the win and also making sure what we're winning or what we're demanding is not going to actually, you know, basically create another thing in the future that we're going to have to tear down, um, if that makes sense. Where we're trying to set ourselves up to actually build on our wins, increase our power. Um, I think sometimes when there's a reform that's put in front of you, it's sort of, it looks nice, but it's actually a concession, right? Because it's actually going to set us back when we want to fight for something else. Um, so I think being very kind of clear about what our demands are, and you can have non-reformist reforms, right? You can have sort of shorter term things that you can win that still put you on a path to get like the major structural change that you want to see. But I think really kind of interrogating the demands to say like, is this going to get me to that larger structural reform that, or structural change that is in my vision, or is this actually going to set me back when I try to fight again? Um, and I think something to learn um, from past movements and even currently is that uh, you really have to fight for it. Um, you just, it's just like there has to be a real, a real fight, a real visible fight, um, a real confrontation with power that can polarize. And I think we have to be okay with that. Um, we have to force the win. Um, it's not going to come just from like an inside game strategy. It's going to take um, 
various strategies to actually win something. Um, and I think we have to be okay with that. And sometimes there's going to be more sort of like militant action on behalf of something. And that might not be the role of your organization, but it might still be necessary. Um, and so I think understanding that. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think what I am trying to keep in mind in this moment is that um, I think history uh, tends to romanticize movements of the past and uh, trying to keep in mind that there is always going to be tension in terms of strategies and tactics in our movement. There was tension in the civil rights movement, tension in the farm workers movement, um, and that that tension will always, it's nothing new, right? We just have to continue to figure out how we manage it. Um, and accept that there will be a difference. I think um, that making sure that we are centering, centering the most marginalized among us in terms of um, our solutions will provide us with the guidance that we need moving forward. And then I'm always reminded, and I think this is to Michelle's point, that politics is like water and it will follow the path of least resistance. So we have to keep fighting and make sure that our liberation is not that path of least resistance and that we don't let up the pressure. Thank you, April. Um, so one other question um, related to this last question is around um, challenges and obstacles we face to kind of, you know, dismantling white supremacy um, and combating structural racism. Um, and also as we see this moment right now and, and how a lot of the messaging has been co-opted, right? We see um, whether it's political parties or corporations uh, moving in and saying, yeah, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. So how do we combat that and ensure that uh, the message stays strong and the core values are appreciated and that there's real intention behind, um, you know, these calls to action? Um, yeah. Anyone can feel free to go ahead and answer the question. Um, I would love to start. I think that one of the challenges that um, BYP 100 is, is really trying to focus on intervening in um, is, is the narrowing of the problem in this moment, is the fact that this moment is called a George Floyd uprising um, when Breonna Taylor was murdered months before, um, when Tony McDade was murdered in the same week, um, and just the, the countless names of Black women of Black trans women, of Black trans people, Black queer people who have been murdered by the police and within our communities um, that are not said as often or as loud um, by too many of our people um, in this moment. And, and the concern of that is that um, abolishing the police and abolishing gender-based violence are intertwined um, because the police inter, um, enact gender-based violence on Black women, on Black trans people, on Black queer people. Um, every day. Uh, and so it's crucial that, that we are centered in that fight. It's crucial that this fight is not about um, ending uh, the like incarceration or oppression of just Black men, um, but to end systemic racism and to disrupt um, and create a world where we're all free, uh, we have to um, center the voices and the struggles and, and the solutions that, um, that free the most marginalized within our communities. Thank you, uh, just, Go ahead, like, exclamation point all over that. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like your, your, your question, Diana, like reminded me of like, of Amazon, uh, the monopoly and like trillion dollar company putting out a statement in support of black lives. And the fact that they are one of the most like exploitative employers like biggest polluters, like, you know, didn't provide uh, prayer breaks for black Somali workers, like in the, you know, they're just, it's just a racist company. Um, I think one of the things in, you know, like, we, yeah, the, the other sort of narrowing the, th the, uh, the problem in this moment is like, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about abolishing the, the police, that is like a piece of something that also involves abolishing capitalism <laughs> and like uh, we we actually like th those two things rely on each other like the um, you know I, I said sort of the, off the cuff a little bit like police aren't 
like in the working class because they're structurally just designed to keep our economic system in place. And it's an economic system that is built on slavery and still exploits black people. Um, and is like massively anti-black, massively patriarchal. Um, so I feel like the more we can continue to make those connections, that's like, no, I'm, I'm actually talking also about abolishing capitalism. Like, I think that you likely won't see like, you know, Best Buy releasing a statement that is in like still in support of that um, or, or whatever. Thank you, Maurice. Um, April or Clarence, would you, or Michelle, would you, oh, Michelle, would you like to address the question? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, you know, echo some of the narrowing of the problem, um, which I think has been a challenge, um, you know, here in New York, uh, where it's like, there was a package of bills that was um, passed, which was really forced, again, because of um, the uprisings on basically a bunch of um, legislation that sort of starts to address the issues of accountability and transparency within policing. And I feel like it was framed up a lot as kind of like, this is like our racial justice package or people were saying that. Um, I don't know if necessarily the state was saying that, but I definitely heard um, kind of that narrative. And not to say that policing and, you know, isn't an issue of racial justice, but I think, you know, in a society that was built on systemic racism, like, all, all of these things, all, all of these systems are racial justice issues. So saying that you've delivered for black and brown New Yorkers because you repealed 50A is not quite true. <laughs> it means you started to do something that we've been asking for for a long time. Um, you could uh, also, Michelle, can you, you know, just give, say what 50A is for, for the yes. participants? <laughs> so 50A um, was uh, added to the New York State Constitution. Um, it was basically a law that, uh, kind of shrouded police records, like disciplinary records in secrecy. For most professions, um, especially for public servants, you can actually see various, uh, you can look, it's for public record, you can look up various disciplinary records or things like that. For police, you couldn't, and it was specifically for police on um, this uh, section of the law called 50A, and people have been calling for the repeal, and um, that happened. <laughs> uh, but again, so there was a whole narrative like, you know, we're delivering for black and brown New Yorkers with this package. And it's like, well, there's that. There's a ton of bills that actually were never brought to the table that were actually addressing the needs of frontline essential workers who, again, disproportionately are black and brown. Didn't answer that. Um, we still haven't seen, you know, the restoration of cuts to Medicaid or healthcare. That hasn't happened. We're actually facing, I think, 20% across the board cuts for the New York state budget, which is going to really impact healthcare, education, all sorts of services that really impact black and brown people. So again, I think, you know, the narrowing of the problem of like, this is our, this is, this is it, this is where racial justice lives, is, um, is a problem. And I think that's a challenge. And we have to really push back on that. Um, and one other challenge I want to lift up, and I think this is something that uh, we sometimes deal with within the union when we're trying to educate and organize um, folks around us, there's often kind of like the push to try and bring in, like get self-interest and buy-in where it's like, we're all in this together. Um, this all affects us. Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't, but like, I'm also not gonna sit here and act like the uh, lived experiences of like black nurses in the public health system are the exact same as like white nurses in one of the like, you know, higher premier like academic medical centers, or even if they worked in the same facility, right? Like. And I think a lot of people on this panel could probably echo that same thing is like your lived experience might actually be very different. And to say that like, this is actually impacting us in the same way is a disservice. I think we can still actually get self-interest and buy-in um, when we're trying to build solidarity amongst workers, but saying that we're all facing the same thing is not the way to do it. Um, and saying that people don't benefit from racism is not the way to do it. Because some people actually, they're lived day to day some people really might benefit from a bunch of like racist shit that happens all the time. So I just don't think that we should just shy away from it because it's easier to say we're all in the same boat. I think we need to just, you know, kind of critique that a little bit and we can still move, um, we can still move through an anti-racist strategy that brings us together. I'll, um, I'll jump in and then maybe Clarence wants to have the last word on this because I'm sure he's going to drop some, some knowledge on us. I think from my perspective, um, you know, we, if we accept this fact that the country was built on a system of racism, 
then we have to also accept this fact that every institution built on a system of racism is also inherently racist. And that includes healthcare, education, and our unions. Um, and for, for the labor movement, I think um, addressing the painful realities of not just our history, but our present um, is a challenge for a lot of folks. Um, because it's going to require us to make some real changes in how we do the work, um, how we identify and uh, support leaders, different leadership models we accept as, as leadership. Um, and it's going to require us to do real work to change it. So I think to Michelle's point, it's one thing to have a conversation about how we hold uh, police unions accountable, right? It's another thing to have a conversation about how we hold ourselves accountable and recognizing that there is racism built in to all of our institutions and that no matter what industry you're working in, your industry is not immune to that and doing the deep work to change it. And I think that that's, that's a challenge because it's painful for folks. Thank you, Michelle. Clarence? Yeah, uh, first I'm, I'm learning a great deal from everyone here. Um, and I really want to thank you for having me sort of rethink uh, some of these issues, you know, as an old timer. But uh, I think one of the, the, the biggest dangers uh, that we are facing is the co-optation of the campaigns that have been launched. Uh, I see it with the Democratic Party. Uh, there are Democrats who are jumping on board with this, not just corporations, but these leaders. Uh, they are claiming, you know, that they have supportive of the movement. You know, I heard um, the governor of New York uh, on television making the argument, why did it take us so long to come to this moment? And, you know, my response yelling at the screen is, yeah, why did it take you this long? Uh, but what we're seeing now is that they are claiming the mantle. They are saying that we have all these uh, terrific ideas that we are going to uh, put forth. And we even have a terrific candidate for the, the Democratic Party, uh, uh, Joe Biden, not realizing that these are the folks who help bring us to this moment. These are the folks who fed uh, police budgets. And I'm not just talking about Republicans, I'm talking about Democrats, I'm talking about members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, who vote for militarizing police and so forth. So uh, I, I think that you know, we're gonna have to really be cognizant and, and, and push this issue that these folks are not on our side. They are not with us. Uh, and you know, that, that is a tremendous task. But one that needs to be addressed. Thank you, um, Professor Taylor, uh, for, for those strong words. And, and I think it is something, right, that we're seeing and experiencing uh, being kind of like there is this whole thing, everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. Everybody's like now all about this, but in reality, their past practices, their actions uh, don't really meet uh, that criteria, don't really meet, don't really feel real um, as to that. It's, it does seem at this moment, a lot of opportunism is happening. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move it over to the audience questions. Um, thank you to our panelists. Um, so again, you can add your questions to the Q&A um, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so the first question um, is, what framework can be used to unify the labor movement? Are unions expanding their political connections, community partners, and support outside the Democratic Party? Um, so I don't know if Michelle or April want to begin with that question. I can repeat it if um, we need to repeat it. Would that be helpful? That would be helpful. Yeah, build okay. solidarity. Mm -hmm. So what framework can be used to unify the labor movement? 
Are unions expanding their political connections in terms of community partners and support outside of the Democratic Party? I'll, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Michelle. Um, and then, you know, I, you're the political director. So I imagine that you've got some thoughts around political connections. I think um, building a framework for solidarity, I think, is to Maurice's point around capitalism, that uh, racism is a tool for capitalism, right? And it is a tool that has been used to divide workers. Um, throughout history so that the wealthy elite could consolidate their wealth and power at the top. That's been played out in our country, you know, for the last 400 years um, or more. Um, so I think using that framework in terms of, you know, what is the history of race in this country and how it has been used to divide workers and the working class um, and how no one benefits. You know, there, there is um, a lot of research that's been done around, you know, a race class narrative and how tied um, class can be to race and, and how we can talk about uh, race in terms of um, it being a tool to divide us and how we can fight capitalism um, and build the kind of economy that works for, for working folks and families and communities, but only if we do that together. And that starts by, I think, by acknowledging um, the foundation of the system and then how we change it. Yeah, and I'll pick up after that. I think definitely sort of what you were saying, acknowledging the foundation of the system. Um, and we've actually been doing this internally at NISNA too, uh, of doing some education around the history of race and um, how it's how it developed and in the US context and also how it's, you know, supports and um, how it's a tool for capitalism. Now, I do think in terms of the labor movement uniting around that or, you know, unifying around that framework might be a question of, where the labor movement stands on capitalism. I will not go there, but I will just leave that as an open question. Um, I think various unions um, would speak very differently about capitalism, maybe. <laughs> um, but in terms of community partners um, and support outside of the party, I think that is happening um, with some organizations. And I think it's sort of getting to what April already talked about, you know, if there's a certain, um, sort of position we're taking towards the economic system and you know how it's been impacting the members of the union how it's been impacting for us you know the sector of healthcare um then i think it actually gives us the like strategic imperative to sort of look beyond what's just been happening as the status quo because it hasn't been working for um the nurses in our you know their communities um the patients that they serve like it just hasn't been working and so we've actually been forced to look beyond sort of the whatever the democratic party machine or however people want to describe it and what building real solidarity with um community organizations with movements what that looks like when we show up for other movements that might not seem to be like directly connected to whatever our healthcare um, policy demands are what does that mean to show up for others um because they will be showing up for us too right um and i think also trying to think of those bigger picture um, structural changes that actually are going to benefit um, what our contracts look like in facilities, what, you know, state policy we get and stuff like that. I think it's just being able to make those connections. But again, um, I think for us, we are willing to sort of take what looks like a risk in, you know, politics, whether it's elections otherwise, because status quo hasn't been working. So we kind of just have to do it. Yeah jump in with a couple of things and really apologies yeah. that I that I have to leave a little bit Thanks, early. Um, there's also a specific question for you. Uh, I can hit both of them. In the chat. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, just on the first point of unions, I'd be remiss to not mention, so we at Acre co-coordinate uh, this thing called Bargaining for the Common Good, which I know a lot of folks um, at the Labor Center will be familiar with. Um, and basically the, the, the theory there is that, you know, I've, I was a community organizer for a long time and I have gotten the call before that like the contract is being voted on and we need 20 people at a rally tomorrow. Like, and that is the level of engagement that happens with the community. Like, I think it's important for us to admit that that has been the relationship in a lot of instances and what bargaining for the common good tries to do is have 
uh, labor unions who traditionally might only be thinking sort of internally about what their about their workers as the only thing um, still think about their workers of course as the you know those are the folks who elected you but also work in collaboration with community to be bargaining for things that are outside of the bounds of the normal bread and butter things so that's like you know uh, teachers in St. Paul, uh, you know, putting on the bargaining table that they, um, you know, don't want uh, the city to do business with folks who are foreclosing on students during the school year. Um, and there's just an unlimited number of possibilities um, in this moment, especially for uh, more unions to take up that mantle um, and move out of this, uh, you know, uh, relationship of the status quo, which I think Michelle was highlighting. For the couple of questions that are that are in the chat, so um, yes, we are working on expanding that tool in a couple of different ways. One of them includes um, includes uh, having more cities. Um, the other includes just some sort of quick social math. So you know how how many teachers does your police budget pay for and that kind of stuff. So um, stay tuned for that. Uh, I can't give you a timeline because research is difficult. Um, and uh, the last question, just thoughts about the current occupation on City Hall in resistance to the budget? Absolutely. Like we sort of part of the, um, as I was saying before with the police budget, like the challenge there is not an economic argument, it's a challenge of power. Um, and, uh, you know, calls for taxing the rich in this moment and defunding the police are along the same, same lines. So I hope it continues until, until they win. I hope we all win. And thanks again for having me on this on this panel. Um, it was a real honor to be with Clarence, April, Michelle, and Courtney. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice, for your contributions. Um, everyone can uh, also follow along in the chat with resources. In addition to that, there will be more information sent out to all the audience participants so you can learn more about the work uh, that Acre is doing. Um, and so just to go back to the, the question that Maurice just uh, answered uh, for other panelists, um, the question was around thoughts about the current occupation of City Hall steps in resistance to the New York State budget, refusal to defund the police, and refusal to tax the rich, uh, if you have any recommendations. Um, and it's also in the chat for folks need it. I'll repaste it. Folks have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can jump in since I'm in New York, I might as well. Um, so the occupation, which I think is being led by um, a couple of uh, community organizations, but I think from what I can remember, Vocal, um, a longstanding community organization here in New York um, that has organized marginalized communities for a really long time. Um, they, are, they have a whole sort of history of doing HIV and AIDS activism and also um, advocates for harm reduction around drug use. Um, they're a great organization, they're really solid. Um, I really personally really like them. Um, and I think they have also used direct action very strategically. Um, and I think with this, uh, sort of bringing the fight, you know, to City Hall, sort of like in that symbolism, making it very um, visible, especially as um, the city and state start to reopen, right? Um, and also I think it's more pressure as City Council has sort of been um, he, trying to heed what the movement's been saying, right? So we've seen various proposals about defunding the police. It has not necessarily met the demands a lot of, of the, um, haven't met the demands exactly of the, uh, that the organizations have laid out. So I think kind of escalating the pressure makes sense, right? Like this is what you do in campaigns. You push and you push and you escalate until you get what you want. Um, and they're taking it directly to the people who decide. For the NYPD budget, that's city council, that's the speaker, they're calling on those folks to actually make the changes. And I think they're being smart in that they have the direct action, they have local activists who have been doing direct action. They also have a lot of um, communication with organizations that sort of do more insider um, negotiations with elected. So, I mean, they're building out a really strong campaign um, and like Maurice, you know, I hope they, I hope they win. And I think tying it with um, the revenue uh, proposals around tax the rich is really important. 
Because I think what happens is we can say defund the police or like reallocate X amount of dollars from NYPD to some other part. But the thing is the city and the state are facing major budget gaps, right? Huge. So a billion dollars shifted from the $6 billion budget to somewhere else doesn't actually answer the fact that we're still in the hole for like, I don't know, $10 billion or something like that for New York City. And that doesn't change, right? Um, and we still need that funding to actually shore up the services that are gonna provide the care um, and humanity really um, to New Yorkers um, at the rate that they deserve. Um, and that's not gonna come unless we actually fight for these revenue raisers where frankly people, the ultra wealthy pay their fair share. Um, and it's not also something that's like crazy radical and out of the ordinary. We've actually seen it happen in New York plenty of times when there have been crises, right? It happened after 9-11, I believe. It happened after um, some of the other sort of economic downturns. Like this happens in response to crisis, they do sometimes temporarily um, raise taxes on the ultra wealthy to fill in that gap. I think I said it before, but austerity is a political choice. Like we don't have to do it. We don't have to cut services that actually help people. We're just making that choice. And so I think having this action that's talking about actually reallocating and prioritizing the services we need along with getting the money that we know exists into the services is actually really smart um, and really incredible. And I, you know, I hope they're successful. Thank you, M Michelle. Uh, so the next question, uh, oh, do you have, Clarence, did you want to say something? Yeah. I, I, I mean, that was a, a wonderful analysis that Michelle gave. Um, yeah, I mean, the governor, for example, has been known as Mr. One Percent because he has constantly cut funding to uh, services, including hospitals, right, including education and so forth. And, and so now we hear this cry that we need money from the federal government, which the, the, uh, we should get from the federal government. But, but how about taxing? the rich roll back those tax cuts that have been pushed through over the years. So, you know, I, you know, I know you've seen as a hero to some at this point, but, uh, you know, we got to look at this guy's history. Uh, and, I, and I also want to uh, make a comment about uh, defunding the police. I, I think it, it, that is a, an important idea. What I think should, what we should also do is call for more community control of police. Uh, we should determine at this moment how police operate in our communities. And that can be done uh, by strengthening, for example, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, giving them the power to discipline, even fire police officers and not go handing it over to the commissioner to make that decision. And we can also call for the election of a civilian complaint review board instead of having officials appoint the members of that board. I think, you know, we've heard about qualified immunity people have uh, spoken about, but in addition to that, uh, let police officers carry uh, li liability insurance. Uh, I mean, there are uh, other ways also in terms of determining uh, you know, the hiring for police officers and communities. I think evaluating how they operate in their communities. These are all ways of giving power to citizens to determine how police should operate in, in our communities. Thank you, Professor Taylor. Uh, so our next question is for Courtney. Um, Courtney, has the coalition worked to endorse or unpeople uh, folks for city council? Uh, and also, uh, this is for all the panelists, do any of the panelists have advice on getting involved in the electoral cycle? Thank you for this question. Um, another big lesson of the Durham Beyond Policing Coalition that we're learning right now is around um, what we can and cannot expect um, from our local elected officials um, and how we have to constantly stay in communication with them um, and, and hold them accountable. Um, most recently,
recently in the Durham budget process, um, we launched the same amount of pressure to demand a defunding of the police budget. Um, and they, our city council unanimously voted um, to give the city, give the police department a raise um, and decided not to give a raise to local city workers. Um, and so it feels like a moment where um, we need to, to lean back into electoral organizing and to um, letting our folks know, our, lo our local elected officials know that they're accountable to us, they're accountable to the people that elected them, um, and that um, in this moment of all moments, the decision to take action against Black freedom, against Black life, um, will not stand. Um, and so my advice around getting involved in this electoral cycle is to not lose sight of this moment, um, to pay attention to the, to the local, state, and federal elected officials who are taking action to, to support and protect our right to take action to protest, and, and paying attention to, the, to our, our elected officials that are um, criminalizing and creating policies um, that target folks who are taking action right now. Um, it's also time to, to look look at who is funding the police and who is t making decisions to defund the police and develop strategies to pressure them to make different decisions or to remove them if we assess that they will not. Thank you, Courtney. Um, did I, April, would you like to? Well, you know, I, I don't want to say to folks that this is the most important election of our lives because you probably heard that before and you know I'm trying to keep things fresh over here but I will say that I think we all recognize that the stakes could not be higher this year and I think to Courtney's point you know like we got to keep this same energy through November right um, the energy in the streets has to translate into changes in the halls of power if we really want to impact change so from the White House to the State House and every race in between up and down our ballot um, Black folks need to be turning out to vote. Um, and so I think um, I would say find an organization that you trust and volunteer with that organization. Uh, make sure that you are registered to vote. Make sure that your friends and family are registered to vote. If you are in a vote by mail state, continue hosting a BYOB. Bring your own ballot parties, bring your friends and your families together, do it via Zoom if you're still social distancing, um, but sit down with your ballot and talk about the races that are important um, and make sure that folks from your community are turning out to vote, that if you are uh, organizing protests and demonstrations that you're including voter registration, that you're talking about voting, um, that, that we are mobilizing the full power of this moment and this movement um, and taking this energy into the ballot, um, ballot box uh, and the polls with us. And lastly, I would say if you have money to give, um, give that money to a candidate that you trust. Find a person of color, a, a woman who is running from your community, and make sure that you are making a contribution to that campaign because it is harder for women and people of color um, to raise the money that they need to run effective campaigns. Thank you, April. Um, do any of the other panelists want to add to that question? All right. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, and this question, um, sorry, I'm multitasking, so bear with me. Uh, so I posted in the chat, uh, but I'll also read the question. It seems the economy will just keep getting worse and the city and state budgets will bring a lot of layoffs. Since black workers are overly represented among public sector workers, so it seems like we might just keep seeing growing unemployment overall especially for black workers. Um, and this question is specifically for April. April, does the Washington State Labor Council have a program to organize unemployed people? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we don't currently have a program um, specifically targeted at unemployed people. Um, I would love to hear from Diana and maybe, uh, or from whoever posed this question and hear from the other panelists if there are models in other states that we can look at um, and what other folks are thinking in terms of organizing unemployed workers, especially knowing that, 
you know, we are facing some significant uh, budget uh, shortfalls in Washington state. And um, if we don't change our regressive tax structure, that the budget will be balanced again on the backs of the workers and the folks that need services the most. So, I mean, we don't. Um, I'd love to give this some more thought and hear from other panelists what ideas they might have and models that might be available. Great question, though. Uh, thank you. So I'll connect you to the person uh, who, who had the question. Um, you may already know them. <laughs> um, I'll jump in probably with like a very incomplete and unsatisfying answer, but um, I think this is an opportunity for some sort of like organizer, like institutional labor, whether it be labor councils or um, various unions to build up more um, solidarity relationships with worker centers. Um, I do know I've had experience like with the black workers, um, work, what is it, the Worker Center for Racial Justice in Chicago, for example, um, where they do have a program that's been organizing um, folks specifically who've been unemployed or underemployed. Um, I know a lot of worker centers have actually really focused on that. Um, and then of course, a lot of various community organizations that tackle different issues um, throughout the community have programs where they're specifically organizing people who are unemployed and underemployed um, to you know, fight back against these budgets that basically have forced that unemployment, but also to fight for services um, so people aren't excluded. Um, and I've also seen a lot of really great work um, when I was doing criminal justice reform, um, especially with folks who have felony convictions, et cetera, who have had barriers to employment, um, barriers to voting even, right? Um, where organizations are taking on those structural, um, you know, those structural barriers to people to actually like ha live complete lives. Um, so I think there are creative ways to actually, um, you know, bring organized labor together and some of these other community groups um, and worker centers together that really want to specifically address this because I do think you know sometimes we do kind of get like very centered on just the people who are within our membership as um, you know unions or labor councils or whatever but I think there's obviously a lot we can do um, to fight for working people um, and our communities more broadly, which includes people who are unemployed or unemployed. Thank you, Michelle. And there's a, another question specifically for you, Michelle, or did, um, Clarence, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, um, I think one of the problems I, I see is in particular with uh, labor leadership and how closely tied they are to the Democratic Party. Uh, <clears throat> and with this, this strong connection with the Democratic Party, uh, I think uh, many uh, union leaders so forth have been taken advantage of. The workers have. I remember the 2016 um, Democratic National Convention. Uh, and when I saw it, it was an embarrassment for labor. Uh, while they were bringing out, you know, billionaires for Hillary Clinton and, you know, uh, law enforcement and the military, labor got maybe 30 minutes in the afternoon when, like, no one's really watching. You bring out all these labor leaders who got up and, and were limited to, like, a five-minute speech and so forth, and then they sort of rushed them off stage. So uh, I, I think we're going to have to sort of demand demand more from uh, labor leadership, uh, and you know I, it's it's one of the biggest challenges. I've been, I was active for years in the United Federation of Teachers and the American Federation of Teachers when Al Schenker was running the operation. You know we formed a black caucus and we attempted to push issues that clearly had an impact on black workers and, and black people uh, in general. So, so I, I think that you know, the, the, the struggle has to also take place within those organizations and we'll, we'll push them more, much more to the left and, and, and not have these sort of strong ties with a sort of lame democratic leadership. Thank you, uh, Professor Taylor. 
Um, so to keep on with that theme, um, how can, and I pasted this in the chat too so the panelists can see it, how can the practical actions, history, and other resources presented here be used to develop dialogue with others, for instance, used as curriculum in schools, in conversation with parents and neighbors? Um, so how can we do this uh, political education work and work around anti-racism uh, that goes beyond the workplace that is in school curriculum? It's, you're talking to your parents about it, your neighbors. Do you all have any thoughts on, on how we can do that? Oh, um, sure. Um, so one of the ways that um, that I would encourage starting this conversation either with your family or um, classmates or um, neighbors is around is around the, the story of safety and the story of our needs um, and and starting with a question like what 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 does it look like for us to have all of our needs met um, what are the things that in your life you can name keep you safe um, and and where do those come from uh, and who's holding them back from us um, and how are we how are we fighting to get more of those resources um, and I think that that's that's probably the basis of the defund the police conversation um, as an entry point is it, talking to people about about safety and about getting our needs met that's why I would start thank you Courtney Courtney you um, did you want to say something, April? Well, I'm, um, I think that if I understand the question, I, I, was, I think I was responding to a question in the chat. So I might have been busted, not, um, I might not have heard the full question. Um, but is it about like, how do we create space and opportunity to have conversations about race? Yeah, uh, like, of, yeah, whether it's um, in school curriculum or in conversation with your parents or neighbors, like what are some tools to be able to have that dialogue? I think what, what we have found to be um, most impactful um, is one, creating a space that we, where we recognize that um, it's going to get uncomfortable for folks and that growth and comfort don't live together. In fact, they don't even get along. Um, so, you know, that you have to agree to be a little uncomfortable if you want to grow in these moments. Um, and so creating a space where folks know coming in that that's the expectation um, and a space where we recognize that um, there are no safe spaces for people of color, but at best, uh, these can be brave spaces where we ask folks to share their stories. And there's real learning, I think, that happens when folks share personal stories around how they are impacted um, by racism. And I think it's moving outside of just the malicious form of racism that for a lot of white folks is easy to identify and therefore really easy to reject. Um, but really having a conversation about the other forms of racism, the cultural, the strategic, the institutional, and the systemic, um, and how we are impacted by those uh, forms of racism and sharing those experiences just um, opens up dialogue and creates space for folks to talk about race in a meaningful way. Thank you, um, April, for that. Um, so this question is specifically for Michelle, and it, it, um, it kind of goes with this theme around uh, education and um, tools for having these kinds of discussions. So Michelle, do you have any advice for bringing changes to the culture and leadership uh, and education and nursing programs going forward? Sure, um, that's a great question. And I think, you know, full disclosure, this is something that, you know, NISNA is currently working on with um, leadership and rank and file members of the union, since this is something that we're deeply committed to. Um, and I think, you know, of course this takes time. Um, I think education is really key, but I also think it's as simple as starting to talk to your coworkers um, and assessing where they're at. Um, it's interesting, we sort of do this in organizing with all sorts of issues, right? Where you make assessments of where are people are, what are the issues, you know, what's actually facing them in the facilities day to day. Um, and I think we can do that around this as well, just to kind of gauge what's actually happening. What are people noticing? How do they feel? How are they responding to the moment even around them? Um, I think what happens with that, you, of course, you can unearth some challenges and actually see where people are at. But you can also um, unearth a lot of supporters, people who are actually waiting to have that conversation and didn't know how to start it. 
Um, and so I think it can really start that way. Um, and then I think it can also start by taking on issues that people are seeing happening within the facilities, whether it's happening to you as a nurse or you as your, or your coworkers, whether it's happening to your patients, whether it's happening within the community around the hospital. Um, we've had lots of situations like that where, um, you know, I think people sort of came out in support of the movement for Black Lives and around this particular moment. And then people started to look at, you know, it was like a major institution, you know, they're very, um, uh, very wealthy institution, um, hospital system. And some of the nurses there were like, you know what, this place put out a statement in support, but they've actually displaced a lot of like black businesses that have been here for a long time. They're displacing like black and brown people who live here. We should talk to them about that, you know? And it's like sort of making these connections that I think people didn't feel that they had the space to make or that the union was a vehicle to do that, right? So I think it's sort of, it starts off slow, um, but I think it's something that lends itself, especially to nursing as um, a profession in that you all are healers and people who are caring for anyone who walks through those doors. I think it's starting there, right? Like starting in the workplace, starting with the things you see day to day, making meaning out of that, and then figuring out a plan of action with um, your allies and supporters among you um, and even taking it to the top, right? Taking it through the program and also the institution that you could be working at. Thank you uh, for that, Michelle. Uh, so in the interest of time, um, uh, that's the final question we're going to answer um, from the participants. Um, I want to remind everyone that we will, this uh, session has been recorded, we will be sharing it out with all participants, along with any resources and organizational information that was shared during the presentation. Um, but before we end, I would like to ask all the panelists, um, what what can allies do to support, um, you know, the movement for Black Lives, to support Black workers? What are, what are things that allies can do? Um, and also, any last words you want to leave our audience with? Uh, why don't we start uh, with you, Clarence? Well, <clears throat> You know, it has been mentioned uh, several times here by, by the panelists. Uh, you know, th we have to uh, just be out organizing. We have to be on the streets organizing. We have to be, uh, <clears throat> be in uncomfortable conversations with folks that we know who uh, have some questions about uh, what is going on at the, this very moment, but um, I, I, it is extremely important, I think, that we, we do this. And we work to change those institutions that are um, locally, uh, not, not just uh, have an impact uh, on the national scale, right? Um, so uh, I think that's uh, extremely important. Uh, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Uh, any last comment that you'd like to leave the oh. audience with? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's important to, as someone noted earlier, to uh, study history. But uh, I am, as, as you know, I said in the class, I am uh, against this old notion that uh, those who uh, don't learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat the mistakes of the past. That's not why we study history. We study history in order to understand why we are here at this very moment. You know, you can't understand racism without going back and looking at uh, slavery. Uh, the the, the, the um, creation of racial ideology and so forth. So I, I think it's important that uh, we continue uh, <laughs> to educate ourselves uh, on, on these very issues before we go out and really speak to folks. Thank you. Sure. I'm happy to jump in. I know we're ahead, uh, April. short on time. I think, uh, well, first I would uh, just challenge the language around allies a little bit and encourage folks to think of themselves more as co-conspirators or fellow abolitionists. Um, if we truly believe that our liberty is tied and our liberation is tied, then um, none of us are free until all of us are free. So we're really all in this together. 
Um, I would say, though, to co-conspirators and fellow abolitionists who are looking for ways to support this work, um, to remember that power is not something you hold, but something that you use in service to your vision. Um, so if you have positional or institutional power, I would challenge you to think about how you use that power to create space um, for new activists and for organizations to reach out and ask the question, how can we support the work that we're doing? How do we support more activists like Courtney and the work that she's doing? Um, how are we creating spaces to center those voices and asking questions that if somebody asks you to show up and speak at a rally that you say, May, no, maybe it shouldn't be me, but I know some organizations you should connect with that you use, uh, that, you use that power and influence um, to lift up other organizations who are really doing this work. Thank you. Um, I think that what um, April said something um, a couple questions ago that, that's sticking with me around this moment, um, the stakes are, have never been higher for our elections, for our demands on our, on our elected leadership. Um, and this moment also feels like there's never been more possibilities for our freedom for us to reach and grab right now. Um, and so what I would encourage for accomplices and co-conspirators and I love fellow abolitionists too, um, is to be planting seeds right now, to think of all of our actions as planting seeds, to be um, having our conversations at home with our families, with our loved ones, with our community members who we're most connected to, to be using whatever resources we have in our, in our, in our, in our reach um, to plant seeds, to invest in Black leadership, to invest in, in the future that we want to see right now. Um, so everything everyone said, um, and you know, I think also kind of acknowledging that there's a sort of a level of political will or amount of political will where this feels really different. Like, I don't know, this, it feels different this time. Maybe I said that last time, but whatever. It feels different this time. I'll, I'll just, I'll stick to that. Um, and I think with that, I don't want, the term allies to me, it feels like it gives some space for people to get paralyzed, right? Like oh my God, here's this moment, but I'm white, I don't know what to do. Uh, like, we don't have time for that. <laughs> we just don't have time for that. Um, I think, of course, self-reflection is important, but like, get educated and then let's, let's organize, let's get to work. Um, you know, a friend of mine, Bianca Cunningham, who I think works for Labor Notes, um, who's just really awesome, great organizer, um, she, she wrote this thing because somebody was asking, like, what's the difference between allies, comrades, and all this other stuff? Is it just semantics? And she was saying that allies do, like, they'll get, you know, it's just something where paralysis is an option, but with comrades and co-conspirators, you know, she says they'll show up in this moment with the same energy they had for Sanders and Medicare for All, um, still taking their cues from Black leadership, but not waiting on the sidelines. And I feel like that really, um, that really encapsulated what I was thinking. You know, that's, that's the level of energy that I'm expecting from folks who want to be allies or co-conspirators or whatever name that they want to take on. It's just show up with that energy that you would show up for yourselves, um, but show up to this movement because you are a part of this movement, basically. That's what solidarity is, as David said. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so I want to thank all, did you have one last word, Clarence? Or? Oh yeah, um, just, um, the issue of power, and that was brought up uh, <laughs> loads of times here. Uh, this is what we're fighting for, right? And we shouldn't forget that. And anyone who essentially uh, opposes that, maybe we have to try to bring them along, but um, I think uh, we have to also realize that there are going to be loads of folks who are in opposition to that, or who, who we consider, quote, allies. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks to all the panelists, um, virtual claps. Um, thanks so much for such an important uh, conversation. Thank you so much for um, sharing the work that you're doing, for your passion. I know that I'm feeling very inspired um, by everything that you all are doing um, and just more inspired than ever. Always been dedicated to, to racial justice, but just feeling more inspired and motivated by hearing uh, the things that you all are doing. Um, so thank you to all the participants as well for participating. Thank you to all the SLU staff uh, who was supportive of helping making this event happen. Um, I want to remind everyone that this um, Zoom has been recorded. It will be shared um, afterwards. 
as well as some resources will be shared. Um, please uh, take a look at slu.cuny.edu, learn more about our programs. I'm a proud graduate of the Master's in Labor Studies program. I took a class for at Clarence um, Labor and Race, which was an amazing class. Uh, there are so many great classes at our school, um, and it's a great community to learn from each other, to learn from practitioners, people who are new to the labor movement, um, you know, to social justice, but just an opportunity to really build community and to build this world that we're all uh, fighting for. So again, thank you to all of you. Um, we'll see you for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.